You're listening to another podcast. A podcast not only of reviewing and discussing, but of discovery. A deep dive into a classic show whose influence is immeasurable. Your next stop, Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and if this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast where I review The Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology series. For archives of all of my episodes, visit AnthologyPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod and follow me on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod and also on Instagram at OVAnthologyPod. Um... And if you'd like to support what I do here, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer for exclusive B-roll episodes, TV and book reviews, movie reaction recordings, commentary tracks, and early access to podcast episodes. Um, That is spread across all of my podcasting, uh, all of of the podcasts that obsessiveviewer.com does, which are the three podcasts that I do. So uh, check that out. Tons and tons and tons of uh, bonus content over on Patreon, and uh, the money helps a lot. <laughs> so uh, check that out, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Today on the show, I'm actually recording this on Christmas Eve um, because I fell behind with with my plans for anthology at the end of the year, and I want to get at least at least one episode out before the end of the year, uh, one more episode out before the end of the year. So, um, and I didn't have any plans. So, uh, my Christmas is, I, I have a busy day tomorrow. So I figure, you know, I'll, I'll do some work on anthology tonight. So it's Christmas Eve. Happy, Merry Christmas Eve. Happy, you know, holidays, all of that stuff. Um, yeah, uh, hope you guys are having a very nice and hopefully warm holiday season and everything. It, it here in Indianapolis, um, It is very cold. Um, The other day, it was like negative 9 degrees, I think, and it felt like negative 35. Um, My actual, my job, my day job actually closed the building um, on Friday, um, but I still had to work from home. So anyway, so today on the show... (laughs) Um, I'm going to be discussing The Gift. It's the 32nd episode of The Twilight Zone's third season, and it originally aired on April 27th, 1962, and I'll be rounding out the episode with a brief review of Science Fiction Theater Season 1, Episode 39, The Other Side of the Moon, which is the Season 1 finale. I, After this episode, I will have finished the first season of Science Fiction Theater, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but before I get into my reviews and everything, um, as I have been doing, uh, these recent episodes, I'm going to share some anecdotes from the world of fiction and science, which is just my way of co-opting Truman Bradley's intro to, uh, science fiction theater to talk about some science fiction stuff that I've watched lately and consumed lately. So, um, First of all, the big one that I have is I saw Avatar The Way of Water um, 12 12 years, uh, 12, 13 13 years after the um, original Avatar came out in 2009. James Cameron is back with Avatar The Way of Water. Um, So I I, I didn't end up getting an Obsessive Viewer episode put together to review it, but I did write a review on ObsessiveViewer.com, so feel free to check that out. I I don't care about Avatar to be honest. I wasn't a I I really didn't like the first movie because it just felt very derivative as as big and expansive as the as the world building is and the visual effects were and all of that stuff. The story just did nothing for me. It was very bland and lifeless. And Avatar the Way of Water, it is very beautiful. It is stunning. It's gorgeous. It is massive. And the story does nothing for me. <laughs> um, it's just, it's very much, it, it just doesn't work for me. It, it was, it was just such a, it wasn't even that it was a slog. Cause like in terms of the actual pacing of it and everything, it, it goes at a very quick clip. It is very, very fast. It like, I wasn't bored throughout the movie, but the actual plot and the character development and everything, it's just, it's not there. It's non-existent. And I need that. I really, really need that in a story. Uh, so anyway, so I wasn't a fan of Avatar The Way of Water. Hope you guys were. I don't, I guess, you know, 
Um, but also check out letterboxd.com, by the way. Follow me on Letterboxd at Obsessive Viewer. Um, also, today I watched Strange World on Disney Plus, the new Disney animation uh, film. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a downer on this one, too. I wasn't a fan. It was. Uh, kind of this is kind of similar to avatar the way of water it's visually beautiful like it is about a uh, a a man whose father was a famed explorer who who left in 25 years later uh the man is now a farmer who is uh conscripted to go into the like into the earth um to help uh save this uh this substance that gives power to all of their electronics and everything so the visual the visuals of it the 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 subterranean world that they explore with all of these creatures and everything it is visually beautiful very colorful and and very well done but the story it just didn't do it for me it was very like none of the character dynamics worked for me in terms of the drama or anything like there's the there's this whole like the the themes of like fathers and sons and and expectations versus what you want to do and everything like that's all like well and good but it just didn't do anything for me and i felt like none of the cathartic moments of of the movie landed at all for me and i don't know so as visually beautiful and as as fun as the adventure was for it a strange world just didn't do it for me. So anyway, um, <laughs> two other things from the world of fiction and science. I rewatched both uh, Blade Runner 2049 and After Yang. Blade Runner 2049 was my favorite movie of 2016 when it came out, I think. Um, still holds up incredibly well. It's it's beautiful. It's it tells a very compelling story. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I love that movie so much. Um, and then after Yang is a movie that came out this year that's directed by Koganada, um, who did Columbus a few years ago, which I wasn't a huge fan of, but after Yang is just beautiful. It is, it is amazing. I, um, uh, I, I watched it earlier in the year and then I rewatched it because my critics group that I'm in, the Indiana Film Journalists Association, was about to vote on our awards. And I'm very happy to say that after Yang got a couple of uh, nods there, um, it was a finalist in our best film category. And I can't remember if it won anything, but it was maybe a runner up for best director, I think. Um, but it's 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 beautiful. It's a very beautiful meditation on uh, grief and family and um, just kind of learning about life after life ends uh, for someone. Um, it's basically about a family who's dealing with the their android breaking down and um, trying to find a way to bring him back and then learning a lot about him in the process. It's very, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful movie. So that's all I've got from the world of fiction and science. Um, and so let me go into my, uh, to my episode. I'm going to be talking about the gift. Um, it, like I said, it's the 32nd episode of the third season of the Twilight Zone and it originally aired on April 27th, 1962. Um, and what I knew before going into this episode was absolutely nothing. I, this is one of those episodes that the plot hadn't, hadn't gotten into pop culture on my radar at all over the years. And it's something that I feel like the, the title was vague enough that it could be literally anything. And I was wondering if it was supposed to be like a physical present, like an actual gift, like it, like a present wrapped up in a bow and everything, or if it was supposed to be like a supernatural ability or talent, like, like someone is gifted with something. Um, I had no idea. And, and kind of my kind of swing for the fences was that I thought maybe it's going to be like a flowers for Algernon type of story where maybe it's someone who, uh, becomes a gifted, uh, human um and then slowly loses that gift over time and has to uh kind of deal with that maybe um but of course i was wrong um and as such let me go ahead and read the plot summary uh courtesy of the twilight zone unlocking the door to a television classic by martin grams jr of course at this point i'm going to be spoiling the entirety of the gift so um if you haven't watched it go check it out and then come back and listen to the review but spoilers on for The Gift, and here is a plot summary courtesy of uh, Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic. 
Late one evening, south of the U.S.-Mexican border, a stranger visits the local bar and collapses from a gunshot wound. While the doctor heals the stranger in the back room, the town's citizens listen... Uh, listens to a story from the local sheriff regarding his efforts to wound someone or something that originated from the circular craft that supposedly crashed outside of town. Rumors spread through the streets that the stranger in the back room is a visitor from outer space. While many of the town citizens are either in fear or uh, in fear of or angered by the visitor, a young boy named Pedro befriends the stranger with a welcome hand. Alone together, the visitor hands Pedro a gift and asks him to keep it a secret for the time being. The army, meanwhile, arrives to take control of the situation. The spaceman attempts to flee, but is cornered and confronted in the alley. The gift Pedro brings to the people is burnt while gunfire erupts, killing the visitor. As the citizens prepare to return to their home, the doctor picks up the remains of the gift to discover it was a cure for cancer, the chemical chemical compound burned away. They not only killed a man, but a dream as well. And starring as Mr. Williams, the stranger in this episode is Jeffrey Horn. This was his only episode of The Twilight Zone. However, he did have a few notable credits throughout his career. Uh, first, he was in one episode of The Outer Limits in 1964. The episode, actually, it's kind of interesting. The episode title is The Guests. Um, and he also had a role in the acclaimed film The Bridge on the River Kwai. And folks from my generation will, will maybe recognize him as Sid, the uh, old the old man in uh, Big Daddy, the Adam Sandler movie from like 99, I think. Um, and then co-starring as the Doctor is Nico Minardos. Uh, this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone, and I didn't really find any... Um, any notable credits or anything. Um, and then as Pedro is Edmund Vargas, this was his only episode of the twilight zone. However, he did appear in a 1963 episode of Bob Hope presents the Chrysler theater, uh, in a story called a killing at sundial, uh, which was written by Rod Serling. And the plot summary for a killing at sundial was a native American seeks revenge on the man. He holds responsible for his father's lynching. And then rounding out the cast as Manolo is Cliff Osmond. This was his only episode of The Twilight Zone as well. And writer for the episode was Rod Serling. And director was Alan H. Minor. And this was his only episode of The Twilight Zone. However, he did uh, go on to direct four episodes of Rod Serling's uh, follow-up series, The Loner. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's the talent rundown for the gift. And I've got to say up front, um, I'm not a big fan of this episode. I thought that it was a little bit, and I, and I'll, I'll get into it as I get through the review, of course, but I just felt like it, it didn't really, it didn't really hook me the way that a story like this usually does in the Twilight Zone. And what I mean by that is a story of, um, fear in a community and people acting irrationally, um, in response to something that they don't understand or something that they think is a threat to them. Um, I just feel like this is a, this is a well, this is well-trotted territory in the Twilight Zone. And at this point, I feel like it isn't really trotted as well as it has been before. And I'll, I'll expand on that as I go through the review, but I just want to say up front, wasn't really that crazy about this episode. Um, but the episode opens with this crow cawing and, uh, Sanchez guiding a horse with, um, with his partner Salvador, um, dead on the back of the horse. And he, Sanchez brings the man, uh, out, uh, bring, brings the horse up to a bar, goes in and he gets the tele telegrapher guy, um, and demands that he sends a telegram. There's a little bit of comedy here as the guy is like, He's he's yelling at Sanchez like, you know, I, I, I tell him every day I close at four o'clock and it's it's past four o'clock and I'm not going to send a telegram or anything. I'm not like this is this is uh, this is you just because you're uh, the sheriff of the town or whatever. You can't just you can't just force me to do something. And then he's saying this as he's walking out of the bar or as he's being guided out of the bar. Um, and he, that's when he sees Salvador's body and he just kind of switches and he's like, Oh, okay. Something happened. All right. Okay. And so he goes back inside and I thought it was kind of, kind of neat, um, how he just, he pulls a piece of paper from under his hat and it's just like, I just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know if that's a practical thing of the time or anything, or if that was a pointed 
piece of i don't know comedy or sight gag or something but i thought that was kind of neat um but he pulls it out and he starts uh transcribing sanchez's um uh statement that he's going to be sending to the uh police prefect um and he says that the message says that sanchez saw saw a craft crash into the hills and that salvador went to investigate sanchez heard uh heard gunfire um and while Sanchez had also found evidence of giant footprints, um, and when he got to the sound of the gunfire, Salvador was dead, and Sanchez chased the monster and fired on it, and he thinks that he injured it. And so we get this very quick, like that is a very, very quick um, bit of exposition, and then we get into Rod Serling's opening narration, which I will play right now. Whatever it was. The place is Mexico, just across the Texas border. A mountain village held back in time by its remoteness and suddenly intruded upon by the 20th century. And this is Pedro, nine years old. A lonely, rootless little boy who will soon make the acquaintance of a traveler from a distant place. We are at present 40 miles from the Rio Grande. But any place and all places can be the Twilight Zone. So I uh, found this interesting because at this point we haven't been introduced to Pedro, but it is, um, it's said in the opening narration that he is going to be um, making the acquaintance of a traveler from a distant place. So I thought, okay, so this, this kid is going to be the main character. And I kind of thought that maybe it was going to go the route of being about the manhunt for the alien and that Pedro was going to have to protect it. Um, and I kind of felt like, well, maybe this is, maybe this is going to end up being like a story that's going to serve as like the inspiration or, or partially and partially inspire E.T. Um, that's not really the case. And to be honest, I was not expecting at all the kind of Jesus allegory that comes into play later, which I'll go in as I, as I, uh, go into more detail as I continue on, but I was pretty surprised by that. And, uh, so yeah, so, um, we see the doctor uh, examining uh, Salvador's body, and he asks Sanchez what happened. So Sanchez reiterates that it was some kind of monster, and uh, yeah, the doctor doesn't have a name. I just realized that. Um, it's some kind of monster, and um, he said it was some giant thing that escaped in the darkness, and then he says that they're sending army army men from the state capital to take over. And so the doctor kind of, he's, he's immediately skeptical of that. And I respect that. And I appreciate that we have that level of skepticism in it because it is an outlandish premise, obviously. Um, but he, uh, he just says that he wants to make sure that it wasn't some kind of illusion, an illusion that Sanchez had. And so Sanchez takes offense to that. And he points at Salvador's body and asks if that's an illusion. And he has this like, indignant prideful energy to him and i feel like that's a pretty interesting and authentic reaction to have in the show for this character because he he has this like it, it's it goes it goes beyond just being like oh i'm a point of authority and my authority is being questioned or my my uh my experience is being questioned or anything it's not necessarily that but it is Instead, this level of fear that Sanchez has because of his encounter with the visitor, with the with the alien. And it's just it's interesting to see him have that that reaction. That kind of it, that's what kind of filters out throughout the entire community because he is raising the alarm. He then goes on to order everyone to go home, and he's just spreading this idea that everyone is in danger. And I, I found that to be a pretty intriguing spin on that whole fear of the unknown plot device that the Twilight Zone visits a lot. So even though I don't, I wasn't really a fan of this episode, I do appreciate that it is a different kind of examination of that fear of the unknown, that communal fear, um, and like that that idea of fear taking hold of a person's uh, capacity to think rationally and logically about a given situation. Um, I find like those like elements in this episode to be really intriguing and really satisfying. What I, what I wish is that the rest of the episode was intriguing and, and interesting to me, which I'll go on. So I don't know. I just, I, I feel like this episode at best is a mixed bag for me. 
So Manolo uh, says he's the bar owner. He wants to close up shop for the night. Um, when Pedro comes in and uh, Manolo just completely just starts berating him, calling him a stargazer and says that he doesn't do his job or anything. Um, and Pedro says like these little, um, <laughs> these little like ominous things like it is, it is said there is life on some of them, meaning the stars. Um, and I, and I like that. I like that as the introduction of Pedro. Um, but what I like even more is the exposition that's dumped on us by Manolo as he's talking to the doctor, because he's talking to the doctor, telling him that the bar needs to be locked up tonight because of what's going on, because of, you know, the danger that's present. And then the doctor asks about Pedro, like, who's this kid? What's what's going on? And Manolo says that he pays the kid to clean up and then the doctor says that he doesn't have any friends, I think. And then Manolo says that he just looks up at the stars all day. And he says that the townspeople or people from the school come by and ask him why Pedro's not in school. But Pedro is not Manolo's responsibility. So he doesn't care. He doesn't have an answer because he's not his kid. He doesn't have the responsibility or anything. And then, and then he asks, uh, Manolo asks kind of everyone there, meaning basically the doctor, and he's really just kind of spouting off hot air at this point, but he's talking to uh, uh, the doctor and Ignacio, I think, is the is the, bi- uh, the blind uh, guitar player, or banjo player, I think. Um, but he says, he asks if anyone has seen Pedro smile before, or even seen him happy, and he hasn't. And so... Uh, so Ignacio, I'm pretty sure that's his name. So Ignacio says that he stops playing his, and I think it was a guitar. I have it in my notes that it was a guitar. So anyway, he stops playing and he says that Pedro has nothing to be happy about because no one, no one treats him like a human being and he's impoverished. He's, he doesn't have a place to live really. He doesn't have, he doesn't have things, um, and so Pedro uh, asks him, asks Ignacio if he wants him to walk him home uh, because of what's going on and everything. And I really found this interesting that Ignacio says that uh, that because he's blind, he says that the darkness is his friend. And uh, and then he goes on to say that Pedro should stay inside tonight to be safe. And I thought that was really interesting that he... Um, I don't know. I I don't know exactly like what to mine from that, to be honest. But I thought that that was an interesting, uh, I feel like there's some metaphor there. Like he's like Ignacio doesn't see. And so he can't like, maybe that's supposed to communicate to us that he's not, uh, maybe that's a metaphor for him being different from the rest of the community and that he's not letting this wave of fear wash over him or anything, but he's still cognizant of the idea that, okay, yeah, you know, Pedro should stay inside just in case. So I don't know. I'm maybe I'm just reaching uh, or grasping at straws there, but I thought that was just an interesting, uh, element to the episode. And so, uh, as, uh, as the doctor is leaving the bar, he tells Manolo kind of with the kind of with a, a a little bit of sarcasm. He tells him tells Manolo that he needs to smile. Um, that's when the stranger walks in and he asks for wine. Um, and this so it's it's interesting. So uh, he then speaks Spanish to Pedro, and Pedro tells him to sit down and that he'll he'll get the man his wine and everything. Um, and I think Manolo kind of, uh, kind of bandies back a little bit saying like, no, 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 I need to close, close the bar. But at this point I kind of realized like, okay, I think, I think this is going to go into a Jesus allegory kind of thing, uh, kind of storyline and everything. And I think that that's due to, um, the idea of him, uh, the, the way that Mr. Williams is presented in that first scene, because we only see him from behind and we see more of his shadow on the, on the door frame and the wall than we do of him himself. And I think that that has this level of, um, I don't know, I'm not going to say omniscience, but like it has this level of, uh, I, a deity aspect to it. I can't really put my finger on it, but for some reason I thought, oh, is this going to be a Jesus thing? All right, <laughs> let's do it. Um, and I did find it interesting that Mr. Williams, when he, when he appears on screen, he is 
nearly the opposite of what Sanchez's imagination made him out to be. So he's a he's a pretty average sized man, and Sanchez said that he was a giant man who who is larger than life and, and is incredibly dangerous and everything. And I just thought it was really interesting and very um telling that he's just an average sized guy. He's not big, bulky, or anything like that. He's not intimidating. And I, and one of the, one of the issues that I have with the episode or one of the the failings of it for me as a viewer is that I can extrapolate that as being, oh, Sanchez was in a panic and he is experiencing, like he is exaggerating things and that's causing the whole town to be filled with fear of this, of this creature that's, that's in, on the outskirts of town that just murdered one of their policemen or since he says that the, he saw giant footprints, I think, um, I didn't I don't know if maybe the intention is that maybe Mr. Williams had his alien shape and then changed into the the physical presence of a man um in after his altercation with Salvador I don't know and I feel like that's an issue with the with the story a little bit because it's not it's not as clear as a um it's not clearly defined like if it was if it was more focused on the fact that Sanchez was was exaggerating and causing the panic and everything then I would be more into it but the fact that I can have this this switch in my brain that says like or maybe it's not that maybe I'm just reading into it and he was actually an alien that switched his shape and everything but I I don't know I think that the the fact that there is that doubt in there is something that's that's maybe that maybe could have been cleared up a little bit better in the script uh before they made the made the episode um so anyway, uh, the man, uh, Mr. Williams, which I don't know where he comes, I don't know where he gets the name Mr. Williams, um, because as suddenly in the episode, it seems like Pedro just calls him Mr. Williams randomly, and then from then on, he's Mr. Williams. I don't remember there being a line where he says, like, hey, my name's Mr. Williams, or hey, here's my ID, I'm Mr. Williams. I, I don't know. But he says that he thinks he's he thinks he's ill and that he's just there for a drink of wine and that he won't stay long. And he sits down and he looks kind of dazed and and kind of uh, kind of injured, really. And I think one of the things that I considered about um, one of the things that clued me into the idea that it's that's maybe a maybe partially a Jesus allegory is the fact that he asks for wine. And I don't know because I'm I'm not. Like, I'm not, like, a Christian at all. <laughs> like, I'm not religious. But I feel like a man in a in a town coming in and asking for wine, I kind of feel like there's something Jesus-y about that. So, I don't know. But anyway, uh, Manolo then brings the bottle to the man, and he places it on the table, but it falls to the ground. And Manolo is shocked because as Mr. Williams is reaching to pick up the bottle, um... Manolo sees that there's blood on the man's arm and he uh he says like wait there's blood that, but but the bottle didn't break like how is there blood or or that's not wine what is that blood and this is where the episode kind of loses me a little bit and makes me a little confused because the man then raises the bottle and lunges at Manolo and Mr. Williams looks dazed and he then hits Manolo over the back of the head just as he gets to the door and then the doctor just kind of looks on in horror at it. And Mr. Williams turns around and says he didn't want to hurt Manolo, but he gave me no choice. And that's where I'm just kind of confused. There are a couple elements of this episode that just don't don't really connect with me on a narrative level because I don't know I don't know that I can I can track Williams going from from being injured and needing a uh, needing a drink of wine to him getting up and knocking Manolo out cold <laughs> um because he's been found out to be an alien. I I don't know what that level of self-preservation is in Williams, especially when you're considering that this is supposed to be sort of a a story about uh, um a a a story about a community that is having a knee jerk reaction of fear toward this outsider when this outsider just injured someone after accidentally killing another person it just seems a little bit a little bit underdeveloped for my taste and i i guess it does make a little bit little bit of sense because 
I can rationalize it by saying that Williams wants to avoid raising the alarm in the community and and raising the possibility of him facing death or imprisonment until he has enough time to explain his purpose there and to give the gift to humanity and everything. I can understand that, but at this point in the episode, it just doesn't track. It just doesn't make much sense. And it's not really presented as this mystery thing either. It's just this piece of action that happens to set up the idea that, okay, yes, this man is going to be staying put in here as the doctor heals him, and Manolo is going to be, is going to be uh, knocked out until his, you know, uh, until the plot <laughs> kind of needs him to come back. Um, it just seems a little bit, a little bit out of character for the Twilight Zone in that it's, it's, it's a little bit sloppy, if I could, if I could dare say that. Um, so, um, then Williams says to the doctor that he has to explain what's going on. He says that he tried to tell Salvador that he came in peace and they struggled and the gun went off accidentally. And then that's when he passes out cold. And then we get a cut to him, uh, laying in bed, uh, laying in bed in the back room that, uh, that Manolo had mentioned Pedro stays in. Um, and the doctor, like he's, Pedro's telling the man as he's waking up, he's saying like, Hey, the doctor will make you well again. You're going to be okay and everything. And that's when he says, um, it's all very odd. And he says that it's odd that Pedro is the only person who feels no fear or anger. And this is where I kind of felt like myself be pulled a little bit more into the episode because Pedro says that it's because they're similar. They're both strangers and outcasts and um, they, they're, they're people who are not easily rattled, I guess, or they're not, they're looked at differently. That's, that's what I'm getting at. And that's what the show is getting at. And so that's when the stranger, uh, Mr. Williams tells Pedro to get something out of the poncho. It's a notebook. And then he, it's, it's like, it's like this, it's a notebook. And he says that, uh, it's a gift and that he'll be able to tell Pedro about, about it later. Um, and then he says to just kind of put it away. So he does. And that's when the doctor comes in to tend to Mr. Williams and he takes his pulse and everything. Um, and he says like, oh, your pulse is actually really strong for someone who's been injured and everything. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say that I wish my pulse was that strong. And again, this is another kind of stumbling block for me with this episode, because I'm a little unclear on what all of this means. Um, <laughs> because it's really, really on the surface, and I think that there's nothing else below the surface in this moment, because on the surface, it just feels like it's really just explaining that Mr. Williams isn't of this earth. He isn't of, of earth. He isn't human. And it's showing us that, like, the, the best I can extrapolate from that is that it's showing that the aliens are, I guess, better than humans or better developed than humans so that they can withstand two shots to the chest. Um, but I don't know to what end that is to be, and I don't know why that's not paid off later. Um, I don't know if it's supposed to communicate that he's just healthier than the average human. Um, and that's why he should be listened to. And that that's why his gift should be, should not be burned. But it also just feels like it's an extraneous kind of line for the episode, uh, to kind of further the mystique of Mr. Williams without really diving into kind of a purpose for, for that mystique. So I don't know, it just, it just doesn't really work all that well for me, but the doctor then, uh, says that he's going to have to dig the bullets out. Um, and he has ether to put him out, but the stranger refuses. And because of that, uh, the doctor sends Pedro away. And Pedro asks, like, hey, can you, like, put him out so he's not, you know, in pain? Because the doctor had said that he's going to have to be digging around in there for, uh, like, more than 30 minutes at least. Um, and the doctor says that he's an obliging man, but Pedro's friend does not want to send the pain away. And this I found to be pretty interesting on repeat viewings because I wondered if if Mr. Williams chose not to have anesthesia as a form of punishment for his involvement in Salvador's death, because later he says that he's come, he's come to this planet to give, but all he's done is take. And I kind of wondered if him being him forcing himself or keeping himself awake during this procedure is a form of like penance that he has to pay for, you know, his involvement in the death of another man. Um, I don't know. 
but it's also again the the episode doesn't really give much to to really latch on to there so Time passes while the doctor works on the stranger, and back in the front of the bar, Manolo has woken up and starts rubbing his head, and the doctor comes out, orders a shot of whiskey, and shows Manolo the bullets that he extracted from uh, Mr. W- Mr. Williams' uh, chest. And that's when Pedro comes out and speaks with just this admiration about the stranger and saying that he's incredible and everything. And so the doctor kind of uh, pulls him aside and asks him if the man said anything else. And Pedro just says, uh, all I know is that he's my friend. I don't know anything else except that that he's my friend. Um, And the doctor goes on to explain to Pedro that, well, the man should have been dead. And he would have been dead for three hours um, by the time we had seen him. He should have been dead for three hours. So I don't understand how he's alive. Um, and then here's the other thing (laughs) that kind of confused me a little bit. And it's another example of me struggling to follow the logic of the episode a little bit, but the doctor then tells Pedro immediately after telling him that, oh, this man who should have been dead, um, and is still alive. Um, he tells Pedro to continue looking after him. And I found that to be really weird because, and maybe this is, I I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to meet the episode kind of halfway here, but it, it's not really computing to me because I just feel like it's peculiar to have a child look after a stranger who not only assaulted Manolo to the point where he knocked him unconscious, um, but he's also suspected of, what can only be construed as murdering a police officer. And I just kind of struggle to follow the logic of it. I don't know exactly where the compassion the doctor has toward him or the, I don't know what's making, I mean, no, no, I, I'll, I'll walk that back. I'll walk that back because now that I'm kind of thinking a little bit more about it, it does make a little bit of sense that the doctor isn't intimidated or scared by Mr. Williams because he was right from the outset skeptical about Sanchez's story, but he also did see, see Williams hit Manolo over the head. And like, even with that, that explanation of, I need to explain that I come in peace and everything. I couldn't, I can't, I can't uh, do that with, with the authorities coming after me immediately. So I don't know. I just kind of feel like there's, there's a level of trust that the doctor has toward Williams that I feel like isn't isn't quite that earned in the episode up to up to this point, and that's a little bit of a struggle for me in the episode. Um, so the doctor then asks Manolo about hearing the door unlock while he was working on the patient, and Manolo says that he went out and told Sanchez to tell the to basically tell the army that they're not going to have to go search for him. The man is here. And that's, and that's where I put in my notes, ha, huh, yeah, Jesus allegory, because the doctor says, uh, he says, uh, Manolo, when you were baptized, they forgot to give you a proper name. And then uh, Manolo's like, what? And then the doctor said, says Judas. Um, and then we cut to like the last shot of, of the act is Manolo counting coins on the bar. And I, I kind of feel like that's supposed to signify the seven pieces of silver. I think it's seven pieces of silver that Judas got when he, uh, turned in Jesus. Um, it's more than seven pieces of coins on, on it, but I think that that's kind of the, the, we get the point basically. And then we get an act break. But before that, I do want to say that again, my big sticking point with this is that like the doctor saying that, saying that Manolo is basically playing the part of Judas in this story is, Interesting because again, he watched Mr. Williams, he watched Williams hit Manolo over the head with a wine bottle and knock him unconscious. Like that just feels, it feels like there's such a disconnect with the doctor's reaction to that versus his reaction to learning that Manolo had gone to the authorities. I just feel like it doesn't really compute to me. Um, And that's, that's kind of a bummer. So when we come back from the commercials, uh, we have Pedro looking over the stranger and, uh, the stranger, uh, quotes that like, Oh, the uh, poet on your planet said that the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry or whatever. He's, he says it a different way. I don't know what the actual, uh, 
one is, but he says that it's it's just like my plans. Um, I came here to give, and all I've done is take. Even this bed and these clothes and everything, like these these like these aren't mine. Um, and then he goes on to espouse about why men fear the unknown, and he says that he's often wondered why men fear the unknown. Um, like children, they're afraid of the dark, but the only person he's met who isn't afraid of the dark is a child. And that's when Pedro kind of says another another pretty interesting line where he says that it's because he's an odd one and that uh, and that it's just because he's odd. And he and Mr. Williams are similar. And again, this is where he calls him Mr. Williams, and I don't know where that came from. But I do want to say that Pedro is saying that it's because he's odd is kind of sad because he recognizes that he's this outcast child. Because, of course, he's been told for however long by Manolo and for from the townspeople that, yes, you know, you're weird. You are a stargazer. You're just looking up at the stars all day and everything, and you barely do your work and everything, and you're no one's responsibility. You're a weird, you're a weird kid. So I, I think that there's a level of sympathizing with the character there, but it's also exploring this idea of this community facing uh, this weird occurrence, but also how they, it, it's a microcosm of how they react to oddities in their community. Um, so like, instead of helping the child, helping Pedro grow into a, a more functioning member of, of the community or not being weird or making sure that he has food and shelter um, and has like a guardian um, <clears throat> who actually cares about him, instead of doing that, they just call him Stargazer. They tell him that he's odd and everything. So I think that there's stuff there that I find pretty interesting um, uh, and, and, and pretty compelling, and especially at the end of the episode when it kind of ties together in a pretty loose way. So more on that in a bit. But uh, Pedro then asks Mr. Williams, um, the the newly christened Mr. Williams, since I don't know how uh, his name came to be, but he says, you come from a long way off, don't you? From the stars. And he even, uh, Williams kind of doubles down and says, from beyond the stars. And right from there, I was just like, oh, yeah, like it's supposed to be more of a Jesus allegory, even, even more exploring that. He's from beyond the stars, so he's not even... From the universe, it's supposed to maybe signify that he's from from another plane of existence, but then the episode just kind of scraps that entirely almost uh, from from that moment. It's just like a little thread there. So I don't know. I just found that to be uh, a little frustrating because I feel like if the show is going for this Jesus allegory, like go for the Jesus allegory. Don't kind of uh, dance around it a little bit. Um, but he goes on to say that the gift is a gesture to show that he came as a visitor and not an invader. And then, and he says that when, when he gives it, he will go back to his ship and leave. And I kind of wondered at this point, like, is this the story of like the second coming of Jesus? And I felt like that's probably not that deep in the episode. And at at that point, I'm still kind of grasping at straws to try to understand the religious allegory of it. But Pedro then asks if he's leaving for good and all, and he says, no, there's no such thing as for good and all. There's only forever, which I found that to be interesting. And then he says, he'll be back someday or others like me will be back. And that's where I kind of thought like, okay, this is, this is kind of like the final part of the Jesus allegory a little bit, because I felt like this is, this is the episode telling an alien first contact story as an allegory for Jesus. And I found that to be kind of interesting um, because that like idea that he would return is an interesting one because it's like what happened in the, then, you know, Jesus and all that. Um, and I kind of, again, I kind of wish this episode went full Jesus and I wish that it would have showed him like coming back from the dead at the end of the episode or coming back to earth or whatever. Um, but I don't know how that could have been made to work really. So that's not bad, but I don't know. It just feels a little bit, the ending doesn't really mesh well with this level of, of allegory in the episode. But uh, Pedro then asks if there's a God where the man comes from. And the man says, yeah, it's the same God. And Pedro says, I wonder if God were to come to earth, would they find him so strange? And that I felt was a little bit on the nose, like, okay, okay. Yeah. I've already sussed out that it's, you know, a, an allegory for like a religious allegory at play here, but that's like, okay, that's, 
a little direct. And then Williams brings up Jesus and uh, says, like, you know, he came and uh, like the son of God came and you know what happened to them, uh, to him. And then Pedro says, yeah, they nailed him to a cross. And then the man says, people spent 2000 years learning to believe in Jesus and that all things. And, and then he says that all things take time, which that I found interesting in the big kind of scope of the episode itself, because that's communicating to us in the grand scheme of things in the grand scheme of the episode that humanity or this patch of humanity uh, that he has stumbled upon is not ready to receive the gift. And um, I I find that to be pretty interesting um, as kind of a treatise on humanity being confrontational and everything and, and hateful and, and violent and all that. But um, but ever the optimist, Mr. Williams says that soon enough, uh, Pedro's people will learn not to be afraid of him. Um, he says they will no longer be afraid and then I can show them the gift. Um, and I found that also to be interesting because part of the part of my initial disinterest in this episode and disconnect with the episode is that it like the kind of armchair thought is, hey, why doesn't he just tell them, hey, I have the cure for cancer here, take it and then let me go and everything. But he has found himself accidentally entrenched in this situation where he has given the community reason to fear him or or the community has given has given themselves reason to search for a scapegoat or search for something that they can kill uh, in vengeance and everything. So the onus is on humanity to be willing to accept a stranger and accept the gift that they provide and everything. But in this case, in this story, fear, anger, violence, that all wins out. And that I find to be pretty interesting. It's pretty bleak, but it's it's slightly less bleak than other episodes that we've seen that explores that explore a lot of these same concepts and everything. So I do find that interesting. But again, the episode itself just really isn't grabbing me at this point. And the episode's almost over, basically. So it's it it just doesn't it just does it kind of falls falls by the wayside for me a little bit. Um, but then the next scene is the army arriving and Sanchez filling them in, telling them that the fugitive is in the bar. And so the army, like the army men immediately like, like chastise Sanchez and belittle him and saying that like, Hey, if, why do you need us? If it's just one man. And then Sanchez says, Oh, it's not a man. It's a monster. Um, and then that's when Manolo comes out to greet the army and, uh, then the army person, I think, is belittling Manolo in this case. And then uh, he just says that, though, this is a village of lions and it's very like ridiculing the entire village and everything. That's when the doctor comes up and he introduces himself to the army guys. He tells them that the man is his patient and he cannot do any harm. So he wants to protect his patient. Um, that's when the army rushes into the bar to find an empty room and then they run outside to try to find him. And this, at this point, is supposed to be the kind of the climax of the episode, of course. This is going to be the big payoff, the big uh, the big thrilling conclusion. And it is to an extent because we get this like lynch mob of villagers. They, they all chatter and scream. They start lighting torches. And one one voice says that the army will protect them. And I find that to be interesting, too, as we get this kind of cacophony of of villagers taking up arms to to hunt for this for this stranger um because when they say that the army will protect them i find that to be really interesting as like the signal of cowardice for the for the community because they're all they're all filled with confusion and fear to the point that they're lighting torches they're grabbing their i, I don't know if they're necessarily grabbing weapons but they're basically acting like a lynch mob and they're grabbing like they're they're taking their pitchforks literal and proverbial but they're recognizing that no matter what they do like they're protected by army by the army and like gun carrying members of the army uh so they feel like they are rationalized or they're they're um they're okay to do extreme to react extremely to this because they have the backing of 
people that are capable of violence uh, toward toward them uh, toward him on their behalf um and so it's it's a pretty pretty clear signal to what's to come someone calls out that they found him so that they surround so then they go to like an alley i think and then they surround him they point guns at him and that's when he he uh mr williams kind of has his hands raised he says that it was an accident and that he comes in peace and the the army people instruct him to walk toward them with his arms out he complies he goes and there's this tense moment as he moves closer and that's when pedro breaks through the group and uh, the man tells him to show them the gift he tells them uh, he tells him like give give the gift to the doctor he'll know what to do with it and that's when Manolo pushes the notebook out of Pedro's hands. And then that's when the crowd goes, the crowd goes wild. Um, <laughs> the crowd starts shouting that it's the devil's work and, and a, vig- a, a villager tells them to burn it. And then a villager burns it. And uh, the man just looks dumbfounded. Mr. Williams looks dumbfounded and says, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Um, which I don't know. I I I don't agree. Like I think that it's pretty clear why they would do it because they think that he's like I don't know. Maybe it's I, I'm not justifying it. I'm not trying to justify their actions or anything. I'm just saying that logically speaking, a, a mob that is that is freaked out and afraid and willing to murder this man is maybe going to be be. It's going to make sense for them to destroy the person's belongings. So. <clears throat> He then walks slowly toward Pedro, um, and then that's when voices from the crowd claim that he's about to attack Pedro. That's when the army fires their guns. The man falls, and the doctor rushes to the notebook. And this whole sequence of events, it feels like it could have been handled a little bit better on screen. And I hate to be just like a downer for this episode itself, because I do recognize that there are some good elements to this episode. But I feel like this entire sequence, it's supposed to be this big, like, this big explosive shocking moment, and it just feels very slow. Um, Like, there's this level of, like, slowness to the way that Pedro and Mr. Williams are walking toward each other, and, or the way that Williams is approaching Pedro, it's very slow, and when you counter that with, or you put that into context with the frantic shouting of the crowd saying that he's going to attack him... It just doesn't really work to show the panic. It doesn't show me why they're panicked. But maybe also that's the point because it's maybe to highlight how over the top the community is with their fear. And I get that and I respect that. But I still think that the final product just doesn't work that well for me because it's just it's a it's a 180 turn with them firing on Mr. Williams when he's just like barely t- walking toward uh the kid. It just doesn't it just it kind of it kind of didn't didn't work for me really. So uh so the doctor gets the notebook and the an army man comes up with a smug smile on his face uh when he asks what it is and then like he he grins a little bit in a satisfactory way. Uh, very smugly, like I said, and tells him to read it. And uh, as he's about to read it, a villager says that, oh, it's black magic or it's something from Satan. And then the doctor reads it. And this also feels a little bit, I don't know, I, I guess direct, but it says, greetings to the people of earth. We come as friends and in peace, we bring you this gift. The following chemical formula is a vaccine. It's a vaccine against all forms of cancer. And uh, then he says that the rest of it is too burnt to read. Um, And then he says, you have not just killed a man, you've killed a dream. And then the episode ends with the doctor going to Petro and saying, let's go. In fact, he says, come home with me, son. And I feel like that's supposed to signal to us that uh, the doctor is going to take him in and maybe raise him himself because he and Pedro are two are the only two people who recognize Williams's contributions, Williams's worth, Williams's uh, um, lack of threat and everything. So uh, the doctor is going to now protect Pedro. He's going to raise Pedro and everything. That's what I got from it. But also, I just feel like that's not 
apparent enough. Like, I feel like that, I wish that there was more to that. I wish that that was more of a big moment at the end of the episode. I wish that that was a bigger, like, closing of it. Um, because we just get that line and then Serling's, Serling's closing narration and then that's it. So I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, speaking of Serling's closing narration, I'm going to go ahead and play that right now. Madero, Mexico, the present, the subject fear, the cure, a little more faith an RX off a shelf in the twilight zone. And that is the gift. Um, overall, I, I appreciate what the episode was going for. I really do. But ultimately, it just feels a little bit weak for me. And it just didn't didn't resonate with me the way that this type of story has resonated with me in the past in Twilight Zone episodes, even though I recognize that they're doing something a little bit different with it, and a little bit more unique, um, and changing it up a little bit. I, it just didn't connect with me. And that's, that's a bummer, but you're bound to have those episodes, um, in a, in a 156 episode series, I guess. But overall, I thought it was just, it's fine, I guess. I'll give it that. It's fine. <laughs> um, and so to round out my review, a few bits of trivia is that the story that this episode, this episode, which carries its religious overtones, uh, originally aired the week after Easter in 1962. So that's kind of interesting uh, placement there. And that this in part- this particular story was originally written as one of the series' possible pilot episodes. And later, um, it was in contention for one of three stories that Serling was going to sell to Paramount as an anthology feature film. Um, I think that was in... I don't know if that was before before The Twilight Zone or after. I'm not sure. But um, it was in contentions for an anthology feature film. Um, and uh, to uh, bring up uh, bring us back to a more sad thing, um, it was a guitarist. Um, <laughs> uh, the episode originally aired a little over two months after the death of actor Vladimir uh, Sokolov, who played the blind guitarist Ignacio. Uh, so, um, that's all the trivia I have for the gift. Like I said, it's okay. It just didn't really resonate with me and it's kind of, it is what it is. Um, you'll have that, I guess. But, um, to round out this episode, I am going to conclude the episode with a brief non-spoiler review from science fiction theater. So to bring us into that section, I'm going to go ahead and play the science fiction theater theme bumper. So when I come back, we're going to be, uh, talking in non-spoilers about, uh, science fiction theater season one, episode 39, the other side of the moon. So The Other Side of the Moon originally aired on January 28th, 1956, and the plot summary, courtesy of IMDb, is a new astronomical camera picks up evidence of strange happenings on the moon. The government launches a ship to investigate, and the answer turns out to be well beyond what anyone thought possible. It was directed by Eddie Davis and written by Robert M. Fresco and Richard Joseph uh, Tuber, um, and it stars Skip Homier as Lawrence Kirsten, Philip Ober as Professor Carl Schneider, and Beverly Garland as Catherine Kirsten. Uh, Philip Ober, who played Professor Schneider, uh, he appeared in the Twilight Zone episode Spur of the Moment, which I think is a season four or season five episode. I'm not sure, but uh, it's one I haven't gotten to yet. And Beverly Garland uh, appeared in the season one episode of The Twilight Zone, The Four of Us Are Dying. So, um, so yeah, like I said, I'm going to do a non-spoiler review. Uh, this is the season finale for season one of Science Fiction Theater. I don't know if back then they had, like, season finales per se, because there's no, like, outro to signify that or anything, but it is what it is, and it is available... Uh, in its entirety on YouTube, I put a link in the show notes of this episode. 
And I think dailymotion.com also has it. I think the link is actually to the Daily Motion link. But anyway, it is available to find online or if you have the DVD set. So um, this episode, it uh, it starts with Truman Bradley talking about uh, the apparently the well-known expression um, heat barrier. And he does this demonstration of these two heat lamps that are pointed toward each other. And he says, he asks, like, if a model spaceship can withstand the heat um, uh, that's emanating between these two, like, major sources of heat. And so he puts this model spaceship um, in between the two lamps and nothing happens. And then he says it's because it's white and it has, like, like color... Um, color absorbs heat, but white does not. So he then adds a sticker to it and he does the demonstration again and then it burns up. Um, oh, that's why. Okay. That makes sense. Now I was, tr- I was trying to figure out like how that factors into the episode, but I do understand now, I guess. Um, but then, uh, that's a demonstration and he introduces us to the episode and the episode itself is okay. Um, it's a solid enough one to, to close out the season on. Um, Larry Kirsten is the lead character. He's a scientist at an observatory. He's just created this new camera for observing, you know, the, the uh, observing space and which is kind of interesting that this episode is is tied to the gift in my review because they kind of can uh they kind of um complement each other in some unique ways that I won't really go into much detail with because um well because I'm not I'm trying not to spoil this episode but basically um yeah so so Katie his wife Larry's wife comes into the observatory and she's basically um complaining about how he's more in love with his camera that he's developed than he is with her um and that he hasn't been home for 2 days uh, because he's been working so hard, which is kind of a recurring theme in these stories in science fiction theater, which I respect. Um, even if it is a little bit repetitive, I will say that here in this episode in particular, there's a certain level of charm between, uh, Beverly Garland and Skip Homier. Um, in particular, Beverly Garland, she isn't portraying Katie as someone who is, who is really angry about it per se. Like she's not, she's not like that, that stereotypical, like, um, wife who's, who's pissed off because her, her, her husband's married to his work. She's more just, she's more jovial about it or she's more flirtatious about it. It's not necessarily intimating that there's like a sexual desire that she's having with it. But I mean, there is, but, um, but it's more of a, it's more of like a, I miss my husband (laughs) and I want him to home and everything, but I recognize that his work is important and everything. Um, but there's just this level of charm through the dialogue, uh, between them that I really like. Um, she refers to him as husband as this kind of term of endearment, um, which like uh, ordinarily anywhere else I would think like, okay, this is just trying to communicate to us that they are husband and wife in this kind of lame way of just delivering exposition through dialogue saying like, Oh, are, are you coming home husband? But there's a level of flirtation and, and, uh, chemistry in the read of that. And she calls him husband again later in the episode as well. That just really feels like it's a lot more intimate and interesting as a term of endearment than it is delivering, um, you know, exposition to the audience. So I appreciate that. So, uh, Larry says that he's had this breakthrough and the new photographic principle that he's developed and everything. And then he's called, uh, Professor Schneider to come look over his work and it's 3 a.m. And, uh, and she's like, is he going to come at 3 a.m.? And like, he's just there in the doorway. He's like, oh, you can tell me no. So anyway, uh, the main kind of the inciting incident of the episode is that Larry shows this infrared photograph of the moon that he took with the new camera. And it shows this giant, like, uh, radioactive corona around the moon and he says that all of his tests indicate that it's radioactive dust that's coming from the dark side of the moon and he uh uh oh okay so he he they then go to the dean of science or whatever 
and he tells him tells them like okay well we need to figure out what this is you should uh conduct more tests for a six month study um but larry is very indignant about it he's he's very rebellious about it he prints a story and then um he prints a story and causes a panic and everything and i'm i'm like okay well that doesn't necessarily make like that that seems reckless that seems more reckless than anything it doesn't seem like i'm i'm not really that behind larry in that because it i think maybe because this is the 39th episode of of science fiction theater and up to this point the majority of episodes have been like oh turns out that you know it was uh, that this weird thing that we saw was just, it was just minerals or something, not like an underwater city or anything. <laughs> um, but I, I've been kind of programmed to think like, okay, maybe slow your roll a little bit, Larry, and, and, you know, actually confirm what you see is what you see before you cause a panic. Um, but what I found interesting is that there is a payoff at the, uh, before the act break at this point, that I won't say what it is, but it's basically they further develop the, uh, they, they further discuss and they further, um, uh, they, f- they further look into what, what it is that's causing the, uh, the radioactive dust on the moon. And they come to a conclusion that I'm like, oh, I actually did not see that coming. And I thought it was, I thought it was really satisfying and, and, uh, it really brought me into the next act in a, in a good way. Um, and so what they do is they decide to launch a rocket to the moon to investigate with, with film cameras and that they can, uh, they can kind of get to the bottom of it and figure out what, what's going on and actually see the other side of the moon. And so I'm not going to say what happens. I'm not going to say what they discover or anything, but I do really love the kind of, again, the methodical, uh, thoughtful dialogue because when, when the mission goes awry, they like a group of scientists sit around and they, they are working through the problem. They're trying to figure out like, like all the variables of what went wrong so that they can figure out what exactly went wrong. And I found that to be pretty interesting and and fun and, and good dialogue and everything. And then the episode ends in such a way that I thought it was, it was really interesting because it wasn't where I thought it was heading. Um, I honestly, I thought that it was going to be a, a scientific explanation like most of the episodes are, but it goes a different route and it ties in really interesting to the themes and everything of the gift. And I'll leave it for you guys to check it out and see what, uh, what I mean by it. I, like I said, I put links in the show notes for where you can see it or you can watch it on DVD if you ha- happen to have that DVD. Um, but I thought, I thought it was interesting in, in comparison to the, the gift. And one of the other things that I, uh, was curious about was at the end of each episode, Truman Bradley says, we'll be, uh, thank you, like, uh, thank you for, for joining us. We'll be back next week with another exciting adventure from the world of fiction and science. Uh, this is your host Truman Bradley saying, uh, uh, goodbye or thank you and we'll see you next week or whatever um and i thought like okay if this is like the season finale is this going to be like are they going to end it in a different way they don't it's just the same it's the same pre-recorded um outro as each episode which makes me wonder if the season two premiere if like the seasons are just if it is like a weekly thing um and there was no season break or anything i'm actually going to look that up real quick um and see what i can find but in the meantime while i'm doing that uh i will say that this uh in terms of trivia i don't have anything really for this episode except that it was the last episode of science fiction theater to be filmed um in color I don't know if I said, I think I did say this before, but it originally aired on January 28th, 1956. And sure enough, it is the season finale, of course, because the uh, season two premiere, Signals from the Heart, aired on April 6th, 1956. So that's interesting. So, uh, yeah, so that is my review of the season one finale of science fiction theater, uh, the other side of the moon. So next week, uh, I'm hoping I can get the episode up next week, but next week, um, I will be reviewing the dummy from twilight zone season three, episode 33. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is kind of, 
maybe give an overview of science fiction theater season one. I don't know. I've spent years at this point, I think, um, reviewing episodes of, of science fiction theater and they've always been like very brief reviews. So I don't know how much I'll have to say about it, but I'll kind of share my overall thoughts on season one. Um, next week on the podcast. Um, but I will be doing a full review of the dummy and, uh, and yeah, so, um, that'll do it for this episode of anthology. I just want to say thank you guys so much for listening, of course, and your continued support. And if you want to continue supporting, uh, you can go ahead and leave a rating and review on iTunes or Apple podcasts or whatever. Um, I think anthology is also on audible. Uh, you can leave a review there. Um, I think Stitcher does reviews. I'm not sure wherever you read it or read it, wherever you listen to the podcast, uh, don't be afraid to leave a rating or review. You can also email me Matt at obsessiveviewer.com or reach out to me on social media at obsessive viewer at OV anthology pod, uh, facebook.com slash anthology pod and Instagram at OV anthology pod. Um, like I said at the start of this episode, um, this is Christmas Eve, so <laughs> if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. Um, if not, Happy Holidays. Hope you guys are having a good, nice, warm winter. Um, and for uh, the listener, um, if you want some Serling stuff uh, tomorrow uh, on HBO Max, you can watch Carol for Another Christmas, the 1964 a TV movie adaptation of uh, A Christmas Carol written by Serling. Uh, so check that out. It's on HBO Max as of this uh, recording. But uh, I will leave you guys with the uh, another just thanks. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening and everything. Um, but also check out patreon.com slash obsessive viewer for a bunch of bonus stuff. If you feel in the giving mood and like you want to support the show monetarily um there are different reward tiers two dollars five dollars ten dollars per month you get a bunch of stuff so anyway having said that thank you guys so much for listening and i'll see you in the next episode and now enjoy this short clip from our patreon exclusive rss feed for the full clip and more exclusive patreon content such as early access to episodes TV, book, and movie reviews and reaction recordings, commentary tracks, and Patreon potpourri episodes, go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. I literally, I think that because what I do is I have like a playlist and I'll like do like I'll have like a couple episodes of freedom and then while I'm asleep, then that's when my voice will come on and I'll start talking and everything and I'll be doing my my podcast stuff like Patreon reviews and everything. And like, mm-hmm. since I started doing that regularly, I have noticed, and this is really sweet. I've noticed that more often than not, when I wake up, pizza is laying like right next to me, like near the phone. <laughs> oh, and it's like, Oh, it's, it's, it's daddy story time. Um, daddy's voice. Yeah. This podcast was edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by obsessiveviewer.com. You can find links to all of our shows at obsessiveviewer.com slash podcasts. For exclusive bonus content, including reviews, commentaries, and B-roll episodes, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.